Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. Taylor Lorenz. The columnist covering technology and online culture. She's a very influential and powerful reporter. After all, her stories appear on the front page of the two most powerful newspapers in the West. First, the New York Times, now the Washington Post. Targeted by really powerful people. Elon Musk banned you from Twitter. You have a new book. New book. I see, yeah. I see it on the shelf behind you there. <laughs> Taylor, I found our first interaction online the other no. day. Do you have any idea what it was? I have, I'm terrified to know, actually. Okay. It was in 2021. Okay. I feel like you'll know as soon as I said it. I was covering, I hate to say this word, I'm dramatic about it. C-H-E-U-G-Y. Okay. You want to say, <laughs> don't want to say it out loud. I was covering in the same vein of like, you know, skinny jeans, side parts, and how specifically BuzzFeed was making all those like generational wars. Like yes. one video would go viral on TikTok and because TikTok was like the Gen Z platform, be like, Gen Z believes this. Yeah. And it was, that word went viral. Yes. And um, I, ha I had included a BuzzFeed article, just a picture like going behind me in the green screen, a BuzzFeed article, some other publication. And then I accidentally also included yours, oh. but you were like, <laughs> You were like, girl, I covered it correctly. You know, like, I did not cover it as a generational war. I covered it as, like, that individual yes. that has gone viral. I feel like we see less of that now because, like, as ever, more generations are, yeah, now on TikTok, I feel like obviously boomers are still kind of off of it, but otherwise everyone's kind of on it now. Do you think that is kind of for the reporting on TikTok is becoming more accurate compared to what it was two years it ago? It was so bad two years ago. Yeah. Um, because people weren't using TikTok. And so there were all these articles of like, these things are happening on TikTok. Speaking of the middle part thing, I, <laughs> I actually called dozens of hair experts about this because I'm, I've been parting my hair in the middle for like a decade. It's the only thing that looks good on my face. And I asked them if that style had changed. And I was gonna write a whole story about it and then I got really busy. I think the GameStop stuff happened or something happened, but the hair people said, actually it was since 2012 that middle parts had been predominant or whatever. Okay. And so it's just like, again, it was like another thing I was trying to debunk this like narrative. Yes. Um, and yeah, I think now, I think now just more people are on TikTok and also people on TikTok are so quick to hold the media accountable that like it breaks through faster. Whereas before it was like, the media was publishing this crazy stuff over here. People on TikTok would be like, okay, that's not accurate, but it never like made its way over. And that was our first interaction again, like 2021. And then it's like, I had followed you on TikTok for a while and then started following you on Twitter. And I feel like growing up, it's like, I only watched really YouTube and like I was on social media. So it's kind of the flip of other generations of like grew up with new media. And then you're just through your retweets, everything like that. It kind of got me more invested in like the legacy media space and the value there, which like we'll talk about later, but yeah grew such an appreciation for your work and also just like, of course, on the record, have to say like, you've uplifted my work so much, which has really made stuff. such a huge impact. Like, cause oh. like on TikTok, yeah, that's like where my main following is, but it's weird cause Twitter, I think because of the cohort of people who are on there too, it's like just, I think my, my um, most impactful tweet, which when I was covering, uh, the posting people without their consent, the gro yes. growth of that, your retweet ca caused this like spirals, domino effect of it. And it was just like crazy. So I had to say that, that I really appreciate your work. And we are here today, of course, to talk about Extremely Online, the untold story of fame, influence, and power of the internet. If you want to hold it up for the, the crowd, no, it's, it's amazing. Like Congratulations on the book. How does it feel? It feels crazy because I always, my whole thing, especially when I started in media, is like I, everyone was trying to write for print mm -hmm. and sort of consider digital secondary. And I always felt like digital was what I prioritized and I never cared about print. I got a lot of my positions and pieces in legacy places by saying, like, don't put it in print. I don't even care if it's in print. Just let me write for the website. And so it's really funny to have something like physical in print. Yes. I don't even have many bylines in print, honestly. Um, and so, yeah, it's really crazy. It's a lot of internet stuff that's now on paper, so can't be deleted. How the hell did you approach like blank slate? 
history of social media? Like, how did you put the puzzle pieces together? Because I know you said you've cut a lot from this yeah. book. How many words did you cut? I wrote 158,000 words, and in the end, it's around 80 something. So yeah, like completely cut basically it in cut half. it in half. Yeah. Um, Amanda Gorman has talked about yeah, like you need to cut the bronze and the silver and just like keep the gold. How did you figure out? what was the goal to keep in the book? It was so hard. Eventually I actually had to hire an outside editor to make cuts for me because I had missed like three deadlines and I I was cutting, but I wasn't cutting enough and I wanted like an outside opinion of somebody that was like, not just my friend because I have a lot of friends that are editors, but I felt like they were too in it. So I was like, I just need some random like person that's totally on the outside. So I found this guy that, yeah, was just read it and was like, okay, this part, this part, this part, like these aren't as strong. And then some of them I disagreed with and I ended up keeping and then some mm -hmm. I, some actually he didn't even say, but I was like, I know that this is not as strong. So I tried to hit everything. Um, I think some of it got a little condensed, um, but you know, it, there's so much. I tried to have just all the, like you said, the gold and the highlights. I mean, I literally, this is like kind of dramatic, but not really. I found myself like almost getting emotional throughout it because I mean, we've talked about yeah. that before of like um, just growing up with the platforms when you, when you grow up with them, especially when you're young, you're just like, this is how the world is and I'm just in it. And it's like, in your 20s, I kind of became more conscious of like, this stuff is really new and it's like wildly impactful and like we're all experiencing it for the first time. So it was just like wild to see the depiction of it. And you know, you've talked about in other interviews that Tumblr was specifically the pivotal moment in your life. I believe yeah. it was what, a coworker that it, had introduced you? Yeah. Yeah. This girl that I worked, I was working at a temp job mm -hmm. and I was introduced to Tumblr. And like, what was kind of that experience of what clicked for you? Like, do you kind of ever reflect on kind of like the out of body experience when yeah, it clicked for you and you're like, this is my thing. Yeah, I talk about this in the book a little bit of this, the, the sort of the social media landscape of the odds. It was very focused after MySpace kind of failed, it was very focused on like friends and your IRL friends. And it was still considered like weird to make friends online. Mm -hmm. And so obviously like any millennial, like I had Facebook in college and stuff like I was a Facebook user, but Facebook was so oriented around friends and had almost no discovery features outside of like your direct physical network. So when I got on Tumblr right after college, it just felt like I was like, oh my God, there's this whole internet out there of like really brilliant people. Because I had been like, my previous, ex I guess like exposure to the internet was like, maybe through like games or like AOL chat rooms, but those were not like smart people that I wanted to like hang out with. It was just like funny people that you could like, exactly. you know. So with Tumblr, I was like, wait, there's all these like really creative, amazing, smart media people on it at that time. Like 2009, when I got on like, NPR, Newsweek, like at New York Times, like every major media company had a Tumblr. Tumblr was ascendant. This is pre-Instagram, pre-Twitter had just kicked off, but like Twitter and Tumblr was more the place for media, mm -hmm. almost the way that Twitter became. Yep. So yeah, I mean, I never thought of being a journalist or anything, but it, that was also the rise of blogger culture. Mm -hmm. And I really identified with that because I wanted to write. Like I thought like, oh, I want to weigh in, you know? And I hated the way that like the more time I spent on Tumblr that the traditional media was covering the internet. And then that's what made me wanna. So you've been covering, yeah, the digital world for over a decade now. Yeah. And I feel like you've talked about how specifically a decade ago, but even still today, that there's not a lot of coverage on the user end like you do. It's always been more on the hardware side. It's been more on the business side and you weren't taken seriously a lot of the time, especially with, even with the rise of TikTok, even today, some people still look at it as like, Oh, TikTok, the silly thing. What what point in your career do you feel like people started to take this topic more seriously? Not just TikTok, but the user perspective of social media. It's been an evolution and it's kind of, you can see it in my book where it's like after the 2016 election, which I covered, it was like, I think because people, there was always this positive tech boosterism, yeah. but it was seen as like fluffy. And like, when I started first started covering YouTubers, people were like, oh, you just write about the site with cat videos, cat video. That's like the narrative about my work, which is so funny. Cause then when TikTok came, it was like, oh, you covered the teen dance app. It's like, yeah. you guys do this every time to these highly influential platforms. Like it's crazy. Um, but so after the 2016 election, people started to look at tech differently. And there was this backlash to it where suddenly people were like, oh, wait a minute. Facebook led to Trump, YouTube led to you know, radicalization. Actually, these things are bad. We need to pay attention to what's on them. 
But the only time that, that, like, the only sort of, like, narrative about what was on them, and this is also the height of the YouTube prank era, right before the adpocalypse, and I think part of the reason the adpocalypse happened is because you had all these reporters suddenly, like, being like, oh, wait, what's going on? These platforms are actually bad, and there's bad stuff on it, so let's write all the stories. <laughs> what's PewDiePie doing? You know, like, he's doing, he's up to no good, and these, and so... Like people started to pay attention to the user side, but it was this really negative. It was almost just like going in there to mine for negative stuff and then like pulling it out into stories. There were, still weren't a lot of people covering it thoughtfully and critically. Yep. And I honestly don't think it was until the pandemic that that really changed because so many people were forced to spend time online and the online world became everyone's kind of default experience of media. And so I think the past couple of years it's been, it's flipped also Gen Z. Gen Z finally is like of age. And I think to younger people, my impression is that they don't make those same distinctions. You point out um, how people will critique the coverage of whether it's teenagers or so. Cause I feel like I battle with that too. Like now being in my mid twenties of like, yeah, if someone is closer to 18 or whatever, I'm like, okay, our age gap is pretty big. Should I cover what they're doing? But I'm like, these people are extremely influential. Of course. But it's like, yeah, you'll get the backlash of like, they're so much younger than you. Like you shouldn't cover it. But I'm like, it's their, in like their influence. First of all, like, I know one of my friends is a pop music critic and we don't say this about literally any other part of culture. Mm -hmm. Like if a 13 year old blows up and becomes a pop star, Justin Bieber, yes. you're not gonna be like, ooh, I don't know, like let's not cover, like you ha young people define culture yep. and pop culture and internet culture. And so it's really important to cover them, I think ethically and not exploit kids. I'm very careful about that. When I first yep. covered like the Hype House or Charlie D'Amelio when she was just, you know, 15, it's like, First of all, these kids have publicists, managers, agents. Like if it's if they're a kid that I'm writing about, they generally have at least a manager, if not an agent and an entire team because they're famous enough to get coverage. But um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's so important to take young people seriously and they don't, especially young women. And young women, we know, drive, they're the primary drivers of pop culture. So Tumblr was your personal pivotal point. Yeah. Obviously in this book, you cover an array of pivotal points within social media. Is there one particularly that like really sticks out to you and speaks to you most, or do you feel like we're living through that moment more so right now? I talk a lot about kind of what led to the end of Vine and the, the, that platform's relationship with its user base, which was very hostile, and that's ultimately what led to its downfall. I think that was like a really, I mean, are you talking about for me gener personally or just for like- Broadly within culture. Yeah, I yeah. think the end of Vine was like a real turning point. For sure, because it's like Instagram had that opportunity but instead of tapping into like to, to d democratize the experience of short form video, it's like they went with IGTV trying exactly. to compete with like YouTube. Yeah. Which was a move and it's like, yeah, TikToks rise. And they weren't providing the creative tools. It was these, it was like places to post, but Vine allowed everybody to create yep. and wanted everyone to kind of be creators. And, and musically, it was the first to kind of like really also like musically always had a lot of creative tools. The but editing like, tools. And the everything. editing tools mm -hmm. and like tools and which is interesting because like YouTube, I mean, Instagram video didn't have, you could like put a filter on the video, you know, yeah. but it didn't have a lot of, and same thing with YouTube. I mean, YouTube had they rolled out, first of all, they didn't even have a mobile app until 2011, which is crazy. I think had YouTube rolled out more in-app editing tools, we would have a lot more people creating content on YouTube. Mm -hmm. I would say both of us are two of the most extremely online people. <laughs> I think anyone would probably say that. Not, okay. You had this quote recently in Tribeca News, which I thought was like so interesting. They asked you, would it be healthier and would people be happier if we were all just like off social media? And you responded with, I don't think logging off is the answer, but I do think our current social media landscape is corrosive and bad. I think it's fine to spend 24 seven online as long as you're spending it in productive ways and within positive communities. So recently Mark Zuckerberg obviously showed the next level of things regarding how the physical and digital world are merging. How do you feel about that as someone who likes to be online 24 yeah. seven? I like, yeah, I mean, I think that the value of the internet is its ability to connect people at mm -hmm. scale, which I think is a good thing. We should all wanna build a more sort of connected, positive world. The problem is like, it's warped right now by this monopolistic tech landscape where Facebook and Google control everything and maybe like a little bit of TikTok now more recently. Um, I think Mark Zuckerberg's version of sort of what the social internet will look like is so dystopian and not good. And I honestly, and I don't think it's VR. I know he wants, it's like every three years, Facebook tries to like make this other push into VR and it never happens because I don't think that's what people want. And I think that the real sort of like metaverse is already the internet that we live in mm -hmm. every day where we're like, 
we almost have like avatars of ourselves online or like we're all sort of characters online already. I think, I mean, I think like it's interesting ideas. I think a lot of this stuff is a little manufactured with Zuckerberg sort of metaverse stuff. Um, I do think that we're gonna be increasingly living in sort of like a, like an augmented reality. Like yeah. we have more voice assistants, we have more like AI is playing a bigger role in our life. Like we're interacting with AI sort of like characters or systems or whatever. Um, but I just, I really hope that Facebook is no longer, like I don't wanna live in a world where Facebook is the dominant social platform or meta, whatever they're calling themselves for the next 10 years. I would love to see like new platforms arise. The Sphere, what you 2 had their first yeah. concert in it over the weekend. And so I was seeing a few comments on TikTok where people were comparing their experience in it to like an immersive VR experience. And I was looking at the tickets as soon as I saw um, how awesome the concert looked. And yeah, the, all the tickets were like 600 plus. And that was at like 3 a.m. the night after. So I'm sure in the morning they like boosted yeah. up like crazy. I was like, okay, something like that is a first of its kind, super expensive. How can people, you know, democratize that experience? Maybe, maybe it is through VR stuff. And that's, I, I just feel like immersive media, it, yeah, like to your point, it's very dystopian, but I do wonder like how I'm, good and captivating it's gonna get. Like, I'm all for it. Yeah. I don't know if you knew, Jules, but I, I tried to be the first 360 video vlogger. Stop. There is a Facebook page called Taylor360. I taught myself Unity and, uh, and video edit, like 360 video editing, because we got, I went to Facebook F8, which is their developer conference, and they were giving out these, um, what were they? They were Rico Theta or something. I can't remember. Mm. There were these 360 cameras. And I was obsessed with 360 video and immersive experiences and all these things. And like, it's just, it's just not there yet. Like, yeah. it's just not, I mean, that was back in like 2017 for Facebook's last pivot. But like, I just think it's like, I think we are going to have those immersive experiences, but I don't think we have the technology to make them accessible to everyone. Yeah. And I don't think that there's like a consumer I don't think that they're consumer friendly enough yet, but sure, eventually, I'm sure we'll be able to like plug our brains into, you know, some system and live like that. Exciting, exciting. Can't wait. <laughs> <laughs> well, towards actually kind of jumping around in your book, but it goes with this conversation of, you mentioned the online world is often more real than our material one. And I love that distinction because so many people want to do, yeah, real versus digital. And I'm like, that, that, to me, that's outdated. It's like, I do physical versus digital. I yeah. know some people use different words. Um, but someone had tweeted at me recently and they said, has human culture really, really changed lately? I'm on dating apps and it's wild. Girls will say, I was trying to stalk you, but I couldn't find your socials. And I'm like, yeah, I deleted them. Do you think an, um, a person needs to be online substantially to be real these days? And I was like, first of all, you lied to the girl because you're tweeting at me. So yeah. yeah, yeah like, so you have an anonymous account. Because yeah, it's kind of weird if someone doesn't have any presence on social media, you're like, that's a lie. Like, yeah. have, like yeah. it does feel like you have to at least be somewhat plugged into the social world. Um, but how do, yeah, how do you see that? Because to me, it's like, yeah, the realest me is on social media, I would yeah. say. So how do you look at that um, relationship with identity? I wrote a story um, years ago for The Atlantic, maybe it was 2017, 2018, um, and I interviewed dozens of kids aged six to 12 about the first time they Googled themselves wow. and the, the first time they realized they had an internet presence. And I was so shocked by the amount of kids that were upset that there wasn't more about them. Yeah. And they talked about feeling like they weren't real. One kid talked about trying to get more images of himself on Google Images because he felt like he didn't exist basically without that online footprint. And I think it's so interesting to think about. I feel the same way sometimes. Like I think that like, and I think also, even if you try to log off, and I talk about this in the end of my book, there's so much data collected on you and everyone else is kind of crowdsourcing your identity on the internet. So like, yep. even if you you're per personally aren't putting content out there, you exist online in a way. So it's like write your own narrative. You exactly, yeah. 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 And I think it's really important to have strong boundaries around the internet, I definitely do. But we all, this is the, like, this is the world and like the, offline world is inherently ephemeral and limited and the online world is much more permanent and vaster kind of you know like far more people will see you and sort of like know you from twitter versus in person you know mm -hmm. so it's almost like more people know that version of you i think the new york times recently did an article too where yeah people were just talking about i feel more free online than mm -hmm. i do in the, the physical real world i yeah feel more myself online um, it was all kids, yeah, within high school or middle school. 
And you talk a lot about the rise of, you know, mom bloggers, influencers, creators, and how they've played such a prominent role in this industry. Like they mm -hmm. really were the forefront of it. Yeah. And I know you mentioned how even when it was just text based on blogs, people were really critical of moms because they felt like they were yeah, exploiting the lives of their family, their children. Most of those women were using pseudonyms. Mm. And it's just crazy to go back because yeah, I talk about the rise of mommy bloggers were really like the first content creators yeah. on the internet. And they were the first to kind of talk really openly and, and about their lives. But because being online was so stigmatized, it was actually, most of them were synonymous. Mm. They didn't, you know, like um, I talk about this woman, you know, she went by girl gone child, you know, and she didn't, they, they also used pseudonyms a lot of times and they, a lot of them didn't even have photos. And they were still just like viciously torn apart. Meanwhile, we have family channels today. It's like what became was so different, but I think the, the hatred has always been towards mothers and that really bothers me. There's this narrative, I know it's not, probably not what you're asking, but it's like my biggest pet peeve lately and I'm so curious your thoughts of like, there's this narrative lately now that's like, moms, you're putting your kids on social media and they're hating it. And now the kids are old enough to tell you how much they hate it. First of all, most kids actually don't say that. Like if you actually interview kids, they've had those conversations. The majority of kids content online is children putting themselves online. Mm -hmm. It's 12 year olds and 13 year olds wanting that Instagram account and putting themselves online. There's way more of that than the parents posting on their Facebook or something. Mm -hmm. Second of all, these tech platforms harvest a massive amount of data. They start collecting data on children from when they're in the womb. You know, they know when a person's pregnant. There's that great New York Times story. They know when a woman's pregnant before she often even knows she's pregnant because of, you know, all of the signal, like the amount of data that they have on all of us. So there is so much about kids online. We have preschools with Instagram accounts. We have sports teams uploading, you know, little league highlight videos to YouTube with kids full names and information. It's so easy to find children's addresses. You can find kids homes on Zillow, you know, like little kids can find each other's homes on Zillow. Like there's no privacy. And instead of critiquing that system, because we have this whole crowdsource system now of like surveillance, it's on the mothers. It's like, oh, the moms are sharing too much on Facebook. They're the bad ones. Oh, mm -hmm. everyone hates them. And it's like, no, you've cre created this massive surveillance infrastructure. And also these kids are now socially conditioned to put themselves online. Mm -hmm. It bothers me so much. I swear to God, I could like, I, I've been thinking about writing about this and I've just been too busy, but. I went through that era of my social media phase of when I did like health and wellness stuff in college. And there's a lot of girls I connected with then who were a little older than me. And now they have moved from Instagram to TikTok as well. And they're in like their mom phase of life. And a lot of them are posting with their kid every day, like get ready with me and my baby yeah. or like day in the life. And like from the moment they wake up with their kid to then I'm like, this is kind of wild. I totally agree that we need better boundaries. Yeah. I'm not defending the mothers, it, but it, I think we need way better expectations of privacy. Yep. I just don't think that that's enough. Mm -hmm. And I think that focusing only on that part and not on the bigger problem is ultimately like, you know, the, the issue because we have six year olds on TikTok. You mm -hmm. know, there are kids, these kids themselves, like, I mean, they always say the number one, you know, profession that kids want is to be a content creator. That is because they are socially conditioned to want to put themselves online. They are growing up watching YouTube. So it's like, yes, parents, I agree. I have a family member that posts way too much about yeah. me. It's now come back to bite me because I got doxxed and a lot of it came from this family member that was oversharing. Yep. So I agree. And I, it's, I don't like when people post their kids. I personally would never do that. But I think it's like, we need to critique these systems and the schools, the schools and the sports teams as well, because they're putting so much information about like, yeah, I know it's, it's crazy. Yeah. Because I was thinking about that too. So like I had found some like articles from high school when I like was playing volleyball. I'm like, it's just weird that these are like on the internet for people to see. And yeah, they can see where you went to high school. And it's I like, mean, like just they to didn't build a narrative you. about your yes. life. And like, it feels really disturbing to lose control of the narrative of your life, not exactly. get to tell your own story. And with all this information, I don't think any of that should be out there. Or I think we need things like the right to be forgotten, which they have in the UK yes. of like, you know, we just need, but that's the kind of change that we need to pressure this for, not just yelling about the moms. For sure. And I, I think it's interesting there too, because talking back to Tumblr, when I was on Tumblr, do you, I don't, what type of stuff were you posting on there? God. Like, I mean, I had dozens of Tumblrs. That was the okay. meme Tumblr era. Okay. But I was also very oversharing. Like, yeah. 
a lot, like emotional, like, I mean, I've t tried to scrub all of it off, but I had like, I mean, I was just talking about like my dating life. Like I was a young woman talking about my life in a way that I would never talk about it now. I did one of these videos. Do you remember? It was like you would hold up a paper or like note cards and one yes. by one. No, you did. That was my big break on Tumblr. Really? And I, I looked at my Tumblr the other week and I deleted the video, but like I saw like you, how you could have those uh, people would send in anonymous messages yeah. and messages and you would do back and forth like Q&A. And I just saw like, yeah, it was like hundreds of messages talking about my video. I'm like, what the heck was I posting? People were like, you're so strong. But I was like, what? That was when I was like 11 yeah. years old. Yeah. I was like, what was that? And thank God back then there wasn't the ability to screen record a video. Because yeah. today, if that was the case, people in your school would have 100% screen recorded it. And even if you delete it online, they yeah. still have, all have it on their phones. But that's another thing today. It's like on the user end too, there's a lot that is and we'll, we can talk about the platforms and what they need to do data wise, but like on the user end now, yeah, with the surveillance of, yeah, screen recording is everything. I just screen record and screen such, screenshot so much. Um, it brings a lot of value, but there is that end of it too. Oh yeah. Have you ever used, uh, what's it called, Pim Eyes? I, no, I've heard of it, but yeah, I Terrifying. don't use it. Yeah. Oh my God, I found weird, you know, you just don't realize how much is out there. Yeah, when I had Googled myself recently, it was like someone had a page on some weird site and they, cause sometimes I'll, you know, I post kind of stream of consciousness even on TikTok and sometimes I post fun videos and they're like, um, they're like, typically she does commentary. She sometimes posts these casual, vi casual videos, but typically deletes them. And he had like four of the ones I deleted. He's like, does anyone have any more? Oh my God. I was like, okay. <laughs> oh my God. Um, but anyway, so what do you deem as the most corrosive things about the landscape that need to be addressed on the company end? Yeah, I mean, I think this um, focus on engagement above all else and prioritization of like just shareholder value, like we have to maximize engagement to make more money so that our metrics are going up. I think that part is really messed up. I also am very against public metrics. I think that was the thing Same. that I loved about Tumblr. It's like, there's no public follower counts and notes you don't really pay attention to. Um, I think what Twitter has done with adding even more magic, it's just like, it's toxic. Like we don't need to know views, even views on a video I don't think should be public. Like if you want to turn it off, I think you should be able, like on Instagram, I hate that like people can see which of my reels, like just fun videos that I'm making. Like, you know, it's like, because it, there's, an inherent pressure, you know, it's like, mm. like if you see a TikTok video on your feed and yeah, it has a certain amount of likes, you'll either continue to watch it yeah. or not watch it because it doesn't have a certain amount of likes. You give value to a piece of content, yeah, based on the amount of views rather than the actual content within the video or just anything. Um, speaking to that point too, it's like Forbes just released for the second year in a row, top 50 creators list. And it's not just based on earnings, it's also based on engagement to what you're saying, like the public metrics, also an entrepreneurship score. Yeah. How do you feel about how they're covering creators? Do you agree with it? Um, well, Forbes is sort of the definitive people to track wealth. Like I know that like they put a lot of effort into their like billionaires lists and stuff. And like, they really do. I think they're really trying to get Trump's tax returns for those reasons, you mm -hmm. know? I think that that you cannot actually understand the value of these private companies unless you. It, it's very hard, and and I think uh, I think a lot of it's made up. I, there's one person on that list that I know their business manager, and it is a very wrong number. Mm -hmm. And so I. I'm a little skeptical. I think it's a good proxy. Like I think that like the people they have, of course, Mr. Beast is on the top. Like yeah. of course, yes, we all know he's made. Is he really making 84 million this year? Who knows? He could be but he could also be making 50 million or 100 million like it's like there's it's kind of hard to tell the value of these companies influencer rates creator rates are still the wild wild west mm -hmm. in a lot of ways um one of the creators on the list was tanks who i know you've written about oh, yeah. before yeah and um i've been seeing some discourse around her her stuff on TikTok because she has a substantial following two million um but she made 7.5 million which was like a decent amount more than some people who had like 20x her following even people with like 30 million but followers she has rich people follow her yes exactly like this is the whole thing with content and i think people don't realize is because i think a lot of people if they don't understand the advertising world they think and they think that like oh it's just about raw followers yep. it's never about that it's about who follows you i mean this is like also why certain people get media coverage i was thinking about this recently because there's this podcast called how long gone 
that I posted, which podcast should I go on on my Instagram story? People have never gotten so much spam about a single podcast. And I was like, why is this? Po-? Like I looked on the chart. I'm like, it's not like the biggest podcast. I thought it was like a, more of a men's podcast, but the most influential people listen to this podcast, I guess, you know? And so it's like, I think it's, or, or like a lot of media adjacent people. So I think that's why it's, it matters. And yeah, Tink's, Tink's, I, Tink's is very good at tapping into that. She has a lot of celebrities following her and she's kind of like an influencer's influencer, I would say. Mm-hmm. So I think she very well could be making whatever she's making. Her personality and the things she talks about is also very, I feel like relevant to the type of person who would be running, whether it's a social media manager at mm-hmm. different companies or like personality wise, I feel like that's very fitting. So if they're thinking about like an influencer campaign, they're like Tinks, like first exactly. go to. Also Tinks is a little bit older. She appeals to, she's young, but like she appeals to a very specific, very lucrative demographic. Mm-hmm. I think something that's been really interesting in the past year is for college athletes, NIL, oh, yeah. name, image, likeness. That's fascinating in the way, so for TikTok specifically, Libby Dunn is the highest earner. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's been a lot of coverage on that. And I understand the coverage in a sense because she is a top athlete, but her income is mostly coming from the fact that she is an influencer on social media. She's not like a top gymnast, like the other top gymnasts aren't within the ranks at all. It's mostly like a lot due to her following. And I've been seeing too, when it comes to these athletes, you know, the ones at the top of the top seem like they have a de- decent in- infrastructure, but the ones that are more, a, a little smaller, but they're, make, they're getting some deals, they don't have like, yeah, a team built out within colleges to know what deals to take and whatnot. And you kind of just seeing them mm-hmm. saying yes to these things. Have you observed what it's like when creators don't have a proper infrastructure when it comes to brand deals? Yeah, it's really hard. It's so funny you mentioned this about the athletes. I'm writing about University of Colorado football right now Mm. and their entire content structure and like just how they've transformed that program and these people like Travis Hunter, Shudder Sanders into like, I mean, obviously Shudder is Deion Sanders' son, but like very famous football player who was always very good at branding. But like, yeah, there. It's just the beginning of a lot of that college athletic stuff, and I think that's always been the case, actually, in sports. Where like the best, you know, like not to say I, Tom Brady is probably one of the best football players, but there's a lot of like marketable kind of football yeah. players that are not the best, but they're just mo- the best at branding. Um, to go back to your question, um, I think it's really hard because a lot of creators fall into that weird middle ground or they get locked up with like some kind of scammy manager that ends up just taking, you know, a lot of their percentages was also a big problem with YouTube with MCNs where like creators want someone to handle the business side, they sign with an MCN and then suddenly they're just losing 30% of their ad revenue without really getting very much. Um, So I think it's better for content creators to think of themselves as as startup founders almost and company, Mm -hmm. because I think it takes the sort of emotion out of it a little bit and it's less about managing yourself as a brand and more being like okay i want to build this company what's the smartest sort of like strategy for me to take can i bring on somebody that's going to really help me um and i always say to hire like an assistant or someone before you hire a brand like a manager i completely agree because it's like your right hand person rather than something overarching exactly you want someone under you before there's someone over you where do you kind of see nil going because it's like I was thinking about the social dynamics of college. You know, there's pros and cons to everything. Um, it's it's the real world. You know, yeah. if someone's a top athlete, they're going to end up making a lot of money. Um, and I think to Livy Dunn's point, she's talked about a lot. Like as a, a female athlete, there's not a lot of professional sports afterwards, especially in gymnastics. So that is, yeah, if you, if you have the opportunity to make money in college and capitalize off of that, that makes a lot of sense. Where do you see it kind of going? Oh my God! I mean, I think college sports is this huge, huge market that's college students are very, I mean, people want to market to college students. And I think a lot more people, I mean, uh, people are talking about, what's his name? I can't, I already forgot his name. Uh, the Heisman winner last year, one of the best college athletes. Basically, I think a lot more college athletes, and I think Angel Reese has talked about this too, are thinking about staying in college before going pro because you can now potentially make more money as a mm-hmm. college athlete than going pro. You just have to go pro to make the money. So I think it's just going to change the dynamics of sports. It's going to change the dynamics of these different programs, athletic programs at different schools. I w- wanted to do this story and it happened right before the pandemic, but there was a sorority in Arizona um, that was saying, basically like they had this whole deck and this is way before Rush Talk or whatever. This was back before TikTok, mm. 2019. I mean, TikTok was around, but it hadn't taken off. And um, they, the, the selling point was like, join everyone in our sorority has over 100,000 followers. 
join our sorority and we you will become an like we launched these brands and it was i mean they're beautiful girls and they had become lifestyle influencers and they had this whole network and they're still one of the top sororities at their school but i thought it was so interesting because it was like this selling point and that's how they were getting the best girls and i think it's a similar thing with obviously college sports because it builds on itself you know it's like look we can make you a star so come to our program and so therefore if you're able to do that you can get the best players I think the current state of online fame is really interesting in the way that, so parasocial relationships is a buzz term for yeah. sure. Um, but interestingly, I've talked to some people who aren't as online and they're like, kind of still like, what is that? And it's just like, you know, the one sided relationship you might have with a media figure. Mm -hmm. Doja Cat recently had called out fans regarding <laughs> like the, the Stan fandom name. She's like, I don't want people to like be under a cohort, under a fan name, like you guys are people, like get a life basically, she was saying. Kai Sinat recently with the whole Washington Square Park situation, mm -hmm. which basically accidentally incited a riot. <laughs> um, and he had to kind of address his fans that, you know, he's disappointed in a lot of his fans, but he just kind of said that to me. I was like, you should have like been like, that is ridiculous the way yeah. you guys were acting. But it's hard for when people are online creators because the point that people were critiquing Joji Cat for is like, don't bite the hand that feeds you. And so like you don't necessarily want to critique your audience but i was recently listening to a podcast from emma chamberlain where she was talking to an author of a book about cults and she's like sometimes i feel like i question the ethics and the morals of playing into parasocial relationships you know someone like alex cooper you know she really plays into it daddy gang taylor mm -hmm. swift obviously really plays into it um but some are more hesitant towards it how do you look at the balance between like creators and audience and like what what it's, is too far? Oh my God, it's so hard. I think it's so hard to navigate that weird relationship. And also it depends on like what you're famous for. Are you famous because of an expertise in right. something? Or is it truly your personality that's the selling point? I think people have a very different relationship with that. I mean, music artists have a different relationship with fandom than um, movie stars, right? Or the TikTokers. And so I think it's like this weird thing because also if you if you lean too hard or you, um, like you don't want to ever become too beholden to your audience because then you sort of become a product of the exactly. algorithms. Um, but you have to stand on yourself too. Also, people love to build people up and tear them down. They love it. So they will root for you, root for you, but if they ever get the sense that you're taking them for granted, you are going to get torn down. Um, regarding parasocial relationships, I'm interesting, interested to talk about this because I feel like we might have differing views. I did coverage on like Karen AI, and I know you know like Karen Marjorie, is yeah. how you say her name? And I, I remember the one time you tweeted that like, if someone like Mr. Beast or like David Dobrik did this, like people would be like applauding, like, oh, this yeah. is genius. I just think sometimes like the romantic thing, again, like the parasocial, like where are the boundaries, even like the safety of the creator, because we know how creepy people oh, can yeah. be. Oh yeah, yeah. So it's like, where do you feel like the lines are drawn there? And I also think, just think how she pitched it in the way of like curing loneliness. Uh, I'm like, I okay. think that's a dark way to cure loneliness. And I hope that that's not our future because yeah. I think it sets completely unrealistic expectations about human relationships. And I think that's something that we should think critically and worry about as we have more interactions with digital characters yep. or chat, whatever. Like, I think it's going to present a whole slew of problems. I thought the attacks against Karen were really kind of misogynistic mm -hmm. that I don't, I, I don't think everybody should be having a relationship with like chat, but like, I don't, I agree with you. I think there's a weird dynamic there. Um, but at the same time, you know, there's always been like phone sex lines and mm -hmm. things like that. You know, it's kind of like nothing new. It's just kind of automating a lot of it. Um, but I think that it's the automation and the scale that we need to think critically about because, you know, so yes, some people, by the way, would spend you know, their entire income on a phone sex line, you know, like it's like some, there are lonely people out there. I think we need to talk about this stuff, especially if we're moving into this world where we're increasingly, you know, chatting with people like that. But I, I just thought it was like, I just think a lot of the stuff that women creators do first or sex workers do gets co-opted by these mainstream men and then is lauded. And so I don't think necessarily it ever should be lauded. I think we should think critically about it, but I think we should also like, treat it as legitimate from the get mm -hmm. instead of just being like, oh, this, you know, whatever, whatever, like writing it off until somebody does it. And then we discuss the ethics. Like we should talk about it now. I think it's ethical. I don't think it's unethical to like necessarily make a chat, but I think it's like having protections in place. The safety thing is real. Yeah. I think it's really worrying to 
but you know, it's it's that's something that I think women on the internet have to deal with all the time. You've talked a, a lot about con different constraints. You've talked about even like ephemerality, which I think Snapchat created a really they don't get enough credit in terms yeah. of what they've did, done possibly for digital culture. I think because it's so associated with kids and when you get on Snapchat, it's more for secrecy. So your parents like don't see your messages with friends yeah. rather than now that I'm an adult. I like using Signal a lot and I like using the disappearing messages that after four weeks the message, messages oh, disappear. Yeah. Again, just for privacy reasons rather than secrecy. Yeah. And you talk about ephemerality a lot in the way that you have your tweets deleted after a certain amount of time. How do of you course. think ephemerality's role is going to increase in our lives on, on in the digital world? Yeah, you know, I did um, Dave Portnoy's podcast recently mm -hmm. and he was just lambasting me for you know, deleting my old content. And I was thinking that I think this is a generational thing. I think he's like 50 or something. And I think it's like he probably grew up in an era where he like was a full adult, you know, mm -hmm. since the beginning. And it's not that I'm like ashamed or anything of my old content. I stand by everything I said. If someone was to find an old screenshot of a tweet, like I would answer for it if I said something, you know, like yep. I'm not against it, but it's, I think it's this like notion. There's this old person, like old, older mindset of like, oh, will you remove something? You must have something to hide. And it's like, no, we just have an, we understand the permanence of the internet. And like, you're talking about those old Tumblr videos, right? Like we all understand like the permanence of the internet. And there's a lot of data and information about myself that I don't want out there. Like I was probably posting things in a way that I wouldn't do now. Mm -hmm. And I think the way that we share and relate to each other changes when we know it's inherently ephemeral versus when it's permanent. Like if you met up with a friend, every single time you met up with a friend and chatted, it was recorded and logged somewhere. It would really change the dynamic of what you said and what you felt open to, and the ways that you felt expressing yourself. And I don't think that we can truly express ourselves when everything is default permanent and default public. I just think it's bad. And I, I agree with you. Snapchat deserves so much credit for bringing ephemerality. And I think we need way more of it. I wish that we could set Instagram photos to expire. I wish that like friendships, even just the notion of connection, you add someone and that's your friend until you manually remove them. It's not how the world is, you know? And I think the more things should be able to fade. And I wish that these platforms were more fluid. So, you know, I think these people love to be like, oh, you delete it, you're ashamed. I have my pictures up from 10 years ago. And it's like, everyone should feel free to private and delete and archive because these platforms will never do it. They want as much content as possible. I was thinking even recently, like, oh, maybe I want to try public speaking more, but so many events now, yeah, they record the whole thing and they post online. You can't really do the yeah. testing out. And I'm like, I just want to public speak and not have it posted on the internet. Like, I just want to try it out and get better at it. And like, again, the real world is inherently ephemeral. Mm -hmm. The Everything in the real world is ephemeral pretty much. And so it's weird that the internet is not, like it's the internet is so permanent in this way that I think is actually against the way that we communicate, like that, that we as humans, like does that, like we, I think we all need more ephemerality in like all of our digital platforms. I think also with a uh, controversial internet personalities, Jake Paul over the weekend was uh, included in the Republican presidential debate he was mentioned. Yeah. Mr. Ramaswamy, TikTok is banned on government, ba government issued devices because of its ties to the Chinese government. Yet you joined TikTok at the dinner with boxer and influencer Jake Paul. Should the commander in chief be so easily persuaded by an influencer? There's a lot of talk about different creators possibly getting into politics in the future. Mr. Beast, Jake Paul, Logan Paul, they've all talked about mm -hmm. that. Uh, what's your bet or who is your bet on like the one who is gonna be the first or maybe most prominent within politics? Oh my God, it's terrifying to think. I think it'll be, I mean, I think we're seeing more and more like, I mean, so many content creators are already playing a role in politics, the entire Daily Wire yep. content, like, world, people like Libs of TikTok, like, there are specifically political creators. I think mainstream creators, I mean, look, Jake Paul has talked about it, and I, I have that tweet screenshotted where he talks about running for president, and I'm like, I, I do believe that he has amb those ambitions, and he's aligned himself with political figures on the right. I don't think, who knows, you know, if he could actually win anything, but... Um, I don't know. I don't think Mr. Beast would do it anytime soon because he's so profitable and he's yeah. so hyper fixated on YouTube. I just don't see him running for mayor, which you really have to work your way up in the political system. I don't think, I don't know. I think it's going to be someone out of left field.
that we haven't seen yet. I'm like curious too if they'll run as like independents because they don't really need party backing. I think like, they'll run on the right. The right is completely intertwined with the internet. Like the mm -hmm. right wing media ecosystem is the influencer ecosystem mm -hmm. for a huge part of the internet. On the left and the center, you have corporate media, which is very aligned in a lot of ways, I think, with corporate Democrat power. And then there are no leftists with me, like then you have like I guess a, a handful of like leftist content creators, but they're not aligned with the political system. We don't have like a leftist political party, so we don't really have the political parties. I think increasingly don't people don't identify with them. I certainly feel that way. Like I just think it's like these buckets that like people look at. Really, you just have two options, and neither of them appeal to most people. I think mm -hmm. hundred percent. And then speaking of institutions, recently Elon Musk, are you? Using X or Twitter? Are you still saying Twitter? Yeah, I still say Twitter, but it's X. I had to write a piece last night. I was working on an article and I kept had to like delete Twitter and replace it with X because I keep forgetting. He sent out three different tweets this weekend I found interesting. The first was newspapers basically just report on what they read yesterday on X. The second one was I don't read the legacy media propaganda much anymore. Waste of time and a sadness generator. Um, I just get my news from X. It's much more immediate. The world class experts and tons of humor. And the third one was please encourage more citizen journalism. You can now record live video easily from your phone. More on the ground reporting from regular citizens will change the world. This man is living in 2008. It's so funny. Did, did you see my article or my piece in my book? Actually, I talk about this is what made Twitter a platform was that plane landing on the Hudson. And um, this, this plane landed on the Hudson in 2009. And um, I think they made a movie about it. And the, the way that news broke was actually a tweet. Through Twitter. Through yeah. Twitter. And so Twitter and things like the Arab Spring. I mean, Twitter, this is why Twitter was such a place for journalism. No one has worked to dismantle that more than Musk. So he is, first of all, he's so out of touch with media. It's funny because he has, people always joke in journalism where they're like, oh my God, like me at an ONA talk, which is online news association talk from like 2010, because mm -hmm. like he says these things and it's like, we know like that, that was, that's been the that's case. been the case for 15 years. And he must, I, I think he is so out of touch that I think he is sort of just learning these things. But, um, but and they he, are amazing things to realize, oh, citizen journalism is like a thing on the internet. He doesn't actually want citizen journalism. Yeah. He's banned all of uh, many of the most prominent citizen journalists. He doesn't want that. He's a pathological liar. He doesn't want citizen journalism. He wants propaganda, which is the people that he's amplified. And I'm not saying this is a musk hater. It's just the fact that he does not support independent journalism. He does not support any form of journalism because he is very hostile to, to the act of journalism. You know, he doesn't want critiques. That's what Musk is known for, suing, suing, suing independent journalists, threatening defamation suits against independent journalists, banning independent journalists, blocking, I mean, what's more citizen journalism than the flight tracker, right? That's a perfect example of citizen journalism where you are, you've created this um, accountability or focused account where you are documenting, you know, the, the sort of like, not a, the real time movements, but like kind of the, um, you know, the flight patterns of something. That's the type of thing that Twitter was built for. Which was allowed when he wasn't CEO and then he became CEO. Yes, and he was, banned it yeah. himself personally because he was getting negative articles and because journalists were using it to say, oh, he's going to so-and-so. Oh, he's likely going to meet with this person. Now that's a news story. Yeah, and it's, for example, his interactions with Mr. Beast a lot of the time of, he's always like, why don't you also post your YouTube videos here? Cause you can get like, now we add the monetization and the ads and everything. It's like. Just that statement in itself, it's like Mr. Beast's platform is YouTube. That's where he yes. wants to get the most exposure. Like also, YouTube has a legitimate ad network. Twitter does not. Mm -hmm. he, the, the, that, those bonuses that he's paying are based on the most nonsense calculations. It's not, an, and also he's kicked people out. I mean, my friend's a big YouTuber, got banned from that program just because he considers him too liberal. You know, like, it's just, he doesn't, there's no monetization. Twitter is not a video platform. It's just not, it was, it was built as a text-based platform. People have shown time and time again, it's so funny with the live video. Twitter bought Periscope for this reason. They tried to make, they tried to make all this live streaming stuff happen in 2015. But again, Elon Musk is so ignorant. It drives me crazy. 
I just, I get a little upset about like, oh, he's talking about legacy media propaganda, putting this huge umbrella, which yes, there can be propaganda with sure, legacy of course media, I agree, but yeah. also same within new media so much. It's, it's a lot of personal base and you don't yeah. have an extensive team. You don't have, and, and again, there's pros and cons to this because extensive fact checking can take out maybe the soul a little bit that people so much, so much love within new yeah. media. But again, it's kind of a yin and yang balance. And I think that a lot of the weaknesses within new media, legacy media kind of helps out in, uh, in the opposite yeah. way too. So I hate how he just demeans legacy media completely because of his personal interactions. It's in because public. he doesn't like, look, I feel that way too, having been covered now more and more in the legacy yeah. media. I, I think certain outlets are bad for the world and I want them to go away. Mm -hmm. Cable news specifically also as a medium, I think is bad for the world. Um, but which I consider part of legacy media. Here's the thing. There is a certain faction of the political right, which Elon Musk has aligned himself with, which parrots the talking points. They talk about independent journalism and they talk about citizen journalism and they talk about d the downfall of the legacy media, but they don't actually want to support an independent journalism ecosystem. They want to just back propaganda and actually decrease accountability. They don't like legacy media because legacy media has reported quite critically on their companies, right? The legacy media is the one that has affected the Tesla stock more than anything else. That's his beef with the New York Times. So he calls for citizen journalism, but again, doesn't want to support actual citizen journalists. He wants to just support a bunch of sycophants on Twitter that will boost him up. So that's very negative. The cultural conversation right now is, of course, around new media, but still, yes, some stuff breaks on social media, specifically within things like, yeah, pop culture, what's going on on the internet. There's still uh, most things I feel break out yeah. through legacy media because it does, yeah, on the ground reporting and just like more thorough research and yeah. like deep dives, investigations. Um, but how do you see the relationship between legacy media and new media evolving over the next decade? I really hope that we can have a much more robust independent media ecosystem. I think that I, I'm not a supporter of the legacy media ecosystem as a whole, um, even though I work in it now and it's given me a lot more empathy for it. I used to truly want to just destroy it. And I, now I'm like, okay, there is value because, because only at a place like the Washington Post or the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, do you have like months to investigate a story and like, you don't have to worry about views, right? You don't have to worry. You can like do these stories where there's a real public interest that can change. I mean, the Washington Post series on the AR-15 last year is a great example of this. Like that level of journalism that really affects legislation and can bring accountability. A lot of environmental reporting is the same way. Like it's never gonna get the views on social. It's never, there's the social media business model is not built to support it but yet. It's important to be out in the world. It's like so that. important yeah. because it's a check on corporate power. Now, I do think that the legacy media in general is way too aligned with corporate power. So they don't always do the chat, like they like to pretend that they are these amazing defenders of, you know, whatever. They're not, a lot of the times they're, they're also chasing clicks. They're, they're bound by a lot of broken incentives, but I think we need it to exist. We just need it to be a little bit better. And we really need an independent media ecosystem because I think independent journalism is not beholden to corporate power, can bring real accountability um, I think it's really important to be responsive to your audience in a way that most legacy media is not and is up with the culture and the issues. So I understand why people, and I, I'm a, yeah, but I just want people to support true independent journalism, not some corporate, you know, corporate backed person that goes on Substack or YouTube and pretends to be independent. One thing I, f I have to ask. So Tucker Carlson obviously went independent, which has been interesting because I feel like when people flopped. Yeah. When they go independent away yeah. from like having producers and everything, the producers a lot of the time obviously help them like uh, steer what segments they want to do. Mm -hmm. It's kind of revealed his personal taste. Obviously, that recent interview with a very conspiracy theory like yeah. Obama situation, yeah. which was just like someone compared it to like the National Enquirer. It literally <laughs> was. It was so funny. Also, I'm just dying because the views on Twitter are made up. You know, we know yeah. that. Um, we know that these are nonsense numbers. I want to see him compete on YouTube because that's the real test. You know, it's like, oh, you okay? So you're buddy buddy with Elon. He's going to give you a bunch of fake numbers so that you can say you got 90 million views. Oh, they're they're you didn't. faking numbers like crazy. If, exactly. As soon as you post, there's a bunch of fake numbers. That oh, come I made a private Twitter account that was locked with zero followers, and I tweeted, and it said my tweet got 700 views after a day. So it's all nonsense, but it's just so funny. Like you said, like I'm actually surprised he cannot compete on the internet in the way that he he. I think he really relied on a lot of support at Fox News and now we're seeing 
him have to compete and he's not that great at it and he's going towards like he's desperate conspiracy thing so yeah i mean i really don't want to see him on youtube i hope he doesn't get on i hope he stays on twitter and just does whatever he wants to do because i'm so sick of hearing of him but do you think there's a chance that i mean the pendulum swings all the time in mm -hmm. terms of legacy media institutional media that the cultural conversation is going to sway back towards that way because when i think of like the next phases of you know social media if it is immersive for example if it depending on like what ai tools etc come out yes ai can democratize democratize a lot within media but also it could get a lot more expensive to create certain types of media we see this within the creator economy there's like the top one percent of creators now that you know they're gaining so much money that it's almost like hard to keep up with their innovation mkbhd talks about this all the time he he invests a ton in his different equipment yeah. so he's like so these other tech youtubers cannot touch me basically yeah. and so it's like do you see something kind of the pendulum swaying back at all within legacy media because that it has the money and just like the infrastructure compared to new media. Yeah, the thing is they have the money and the infrastructure, but they don't know how to reach audiences online. Mm -hmm. They're quite out of step with culture. They're still way be too beholden to corporate power and political power. So I think I love MKB, mm -hmm. like, I mean, um, I always say, I, always I know say, it's like MKB, MKB, MKB HD. HD. <laughs> um, Marquez Brownlee basically yes. is a genius and I think is like, I mean, a phenomenal tech journalist yeah. um, and what he does. And there's also people like Johnny Harris or Cleo Abram who left Vox, you know, and have the, do amazing independent journalism. Even that guy, Coffeezilla, you know, who d breaks yeah. like, I mean, he's doing phenomenal journalism online and crypto investigations. So there are, there are great journalists online. I think they can reach people and they have enough of an audience that they can take a step, they can invest those resources. But it's like this middle ground and getting there that's really hard. Which story or trend that you've covered had the most profound impact on you personally? I mean, I think about that one where I interviewed kids a lot. Like, I think a lot of the ones where I talk to kids affect me because I really think a lot about kind of like- The future. The future. And like, I think it's interesting to actually talk to people. You know, I did a, a feature for The Atlantic years ago about what it's like for parents who raise kids that become famous online. I think it was in 2017 or something. It was a long time ago. Um, and I think about that a lot because I eventually want to be a parent. And I just think about the dynamics, how like how these like family dynamics are reshaped by online attention and those genres of stories, I think, like make me think differently. When it comes to our increasing lives online, yeah, being online 24 seven, how do you think, let, let's say everyone ends up wanting to be plugged in 24 seven. It's like, what is parenting like at that point, I've been thinking a lot about because there's the jokes now. We are just like kind of throwing an iPad in a kid's face. Yeah. And like, I mean, it is kind of true that these social media platforms and what's being consumed is teaching these kids their maybe values, et cetera. A hundred percent. I'm like, I wonder what that's going to look like in a decade if immersive technology does become the full thing. I think it will. And yeah. I think our kids are going to be in those experiences. Um, yeah, I think about it a lot. I mean, I was a nanny and a kind of a step parent for a while. Mm -hmm. And I've spent so much time with kids. And um, it is hard because it's like, you always want to be the one that's like, oh, I'm not going to put my, my kids not going to be my I'm raising my kid on organic food and da, da, da. But when you're sleep deprived, and you've got all this stuff, it's like I there's just increasingly these like technological solutions. Um, I was watching a video by Miss Rachel, you know, Miss Rachel for Littles. I don't. Oh, she's a huge children's content creator. And she talks a lot about reaching kids with sort of disability, like learning disabilities and things. I had a really severe learning disability. And um, I think if I had access to technology it actually would have really helped me in, in sort of growing up and in school and fine. And so I think it can be really good and bad, but yeah, I don't know if my baby's gonna be in VR or not. I know, I'm like, <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's like, are the little kids just gonna be plugged in all the time? Or but I do think humans are resilient and like, you know, who knows? People are so adaptable. I was waiting for the subway the other day and my phone had died. And usually I'm always on my phone oh, yeah. waiting for the subway. So you get that moment where you look around and everyone's on their phone. You're like, oh, everyone's on their phone these days. Um, but then I was like, it just depends to your point what people are doing on their phone. Someone could be coming across a piece of information, content, whatever, that sparks immense curiosity, yeah. learning. Someone else, yeah, could be diving into like immense junk food content constantly. It just yeah. depends. I think that's what's important for kids to learn is to create those separations for yourself. I found myself recently, I like lifestyle content. I think it's fun to watch. 
but I only want to watch it when I'm in the mind space where like I'm not going to be comparing myself and all these different things not like I typically don't follow lifestyle influencers because then when I get on my feed it's not fed to me as much yeah. I just go to their pages for example when I'm ready to and like I'm in a good headspace and like oh what, what's been going on and I think like that type of stuff is important for kids to learn I think it's so I always say like the number one thing you need on the internet is a really strong sense of self yep and I think that's the most important thing to teach your kids and like just anybody to have because I think like who knows what the world is going to be like but i think if you have people like if, if a person has a strong sense of self they can like generally handle things what would your advice to journalists alongside you or the ones coming up who are covering digital culture be specifically over the next decade go independent don't don't go to a media company don't don't do that just go independent and now i, I mean if i could have been independent when i started as a blogger, if I could have monetized better, I would have never gotten a traditional media. And I'm glad that I did, but I think the time to do that is like later on in life. Like you can always work at those places, but especially if you're young, you you will learn so much more and you'll be so much better prepared. Like, I mean, I think sometimes there's been resentment of maybe people say, oh, she, Taylor came up kind of quickly or whatever, which is not true, by the way. I'm like literally old and have been working in media for like 13 years, but, um, but I was able to kind of leapfrog a lot because I had done so much online and built my own platform online and was a blogger for years and wrote for years. And so it's like when I came into traditional media, I already had a, a lot more skills than if I had just tried to rise the ranks. Yep. Otherwise, I'd still be like a, a, you know, assistant something, right? Like if I had tried to go through that system, don't ever buy into any kind of corporate system or legacy thing where you're waiting your turn. Because there's always just going to be people that, that are leapfrogging you, that have done their own thing. Amazing. Taylor, thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it so much. And everyone, get your copy of Extremely Long. Yes. Get the physical hard copy so you can have it in your uh, the non-digital world. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs>